Thank you, Jenny, for that nice introduction. And thank you, First Church, San Luis Obispo, for hosting this lecture. And thank you, Hillary, for that beautiful music. I was sitting in church earlier listening, and I thought, oh, this is why we have musical preludes and postludes in a church, because our thought gets quiet, and we start to think about those things that really matter. So thanks for preparing our thoughts. Um, thank you all for coming out this afternoon to think about those important things. Now, before I start, I just want to clear out a possible misconception. Sometimes people confuse Christian science with Scientology. And I just want to say right at the top that Christian science has nothing whatever to do with Scientology. Christian science is first and foremost Christian. And our church members read the Bible. They read this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which was written by the woman who discovered and founded Christian science, Mary Baker Eddy, to deepen their understanding of how and why Jesus' teachings are something we can prove true in our own experience, including the practice of Christian healing. So this was something that really came into focus for me some years ago when I had an experience that made me aware that there is a really different way to think. This experience just disrupted all my assumptions and beliefs about how things work. Because of it, I was healed overnight of numerous physical problems. And it was Christian science that made sense of, of what had happened, this, this healing paradigm shift, by showing me that Jesus' teaching that God is love, always present, all-powerful, unconditional love, is actually scientific. It's something that we can prove and practice in our lives. So as you might imagine, my, my first response to this experience was joy. It was, it was great to be well after years of illness. But I also found myself filled with a really powerful sense of hope. And not just for myself, but, but hope for everybody, because if just Recognizing the presence of this love could have such a transforming effect on my life than, than it could for anybody. Uh, Albert Einstein once said, a new type of thinking is essential if mankind is to survive and move toward higher levels. And the kind of thinking we'll be talking about today that's just what it does. It gives us a practical way to find love's presence and that practical goodness. So as Jenny said, the topic today is finding where God is seen and felt, and that grew out of my experience. And then there's a subtitle, What's Church Got to Do With It? And I hope to show you that those two things actually do go together, because whenever and, and wherever you start from the premise of love's presence, you are going to find that healing, transforming power. And whenever and wherever you live in accord with that love, you respond to it, you become part of the church that Jesus and the early Christians talked about. And this is not a, a bricks and mortar denomination, but a response to God's goodness that includes us all. So those two things, the recognition of love's presence and our response to it, are what will scientifically move us toward those much needed higher levels. Now, when I was a child, God's goodness was very real to me. There's a, there's a line from a poem by William Wordsworth that talks about the naturalness of that. He wrote, trailing clouds of glory, we come from God. 
who is our home. And all heaven lies about us in our infancy. And Jesus was known for saying that little children with their innocence and their trust in good were closer to God than adults who come with their opinions and their fears and their biases. And I think that tells us something essential about who we really are. That our own love of good, our desire for it, our expectation of it in our lives is natural. And that is what opens the way for love to reach us and shine through even in difficult conditions. So I was raised in Christian science. Things I learned in Sunday school, the things my mother told me, all just confirmed that already present sense of good that I had as a child. So I was taught that God is divine and supreme and infinite, which to me just meant that God is completely good, that this goodness is the most powerful thing there is, and it's everywhere all the time. And then in Sunday school, I was taught names for God that helped me see the entireness of this goodness. So I was taught that God is principle, the foundation, the structure of everything, that God is mind, soul, and spirit, which are all terms for God that you find in the Bible, that God is life itself, that God is truth, reality itself, and that God is, as Jesus taught, love. And so thinking on this, thinking, for example, that, that mind is divine, helped me to see that what God knows is entirely good, that mind is supreme, told me that what God knows is the final word, that mind is infinite, assured me that there was no place I could be where this divine intelligence wasn't active and present with me. So I learned to pray not by asking God to take away my problems, but rather by thinking specifically about what God is and what God is doing right there in real time. So if, if God's goodness seemed distant, then I could know that it was just that, it was a seeming. Because in fact, life's goodness and love's presence, mind's authority were, were all there. So when I was very small, I used to get earaches every time I'd go swimming, which was a problem because I loved swimming. And one night just realizing that God's goodness fills all space and realizing that that had to include the space where my ears were, put an end to the earaches. A few years later, I was in a car with my mom. We were driving to a doctor to get me checked into a hospital to have my tonsils out. A lot of my friends were having that surgery and my dad, who was not a Christian scientist, thought maybe that would be a good idea because I'd been missing a lot of school due to sore throats. But I remember my mother turning to me and saying, you know what God knows about you is all there is to know. And it was like a light bulb went on. I think up to that point, I had just been sort of wishing the whole problem would go away. But at that moment, it got real. And I knew that what she had said was true. So we got to the doctor and he examined me and he said to my mother, these tonsils are perfect, there's no need for surgery, and he sent us home. When I was in fifth grade, there came an evening when I felt a really desperate need to pray. And I thought I'd start with the Lord's Prayer, that prayer Jesus taught his followers that starts our Father, meaning God. And I didn't get past those first two words because I suddenly realized that not only did our Father mean that 
that I was the loved and cared for child of God, but the group of girls at school who had been bullying me for months, they actually also were God's loved children. And it just gave me a completely different perspective on who they were. So I got to school the next day and there was no bullying. It was like the whole thing had never happened. So praying this way, it felt natural. It felt normal. It felt joyful. I probably could not have explained the metaphysical logic that because there is really just one primal cause, God, that means there can't be an effect from any other cause. And I don't think I fully grasped the theology that, that it was the very nature of God that assured my safety and well-being. I just knew when I made room in my thought for a God who is love, it felt like coming home and healing followed. So as I got into my teen years, I stopped making room for God. God was getting crowded out by the things I saw on the evening news and read in the paper and heard about at school and talked about with my friends and all of those things made belief in a supreme goodness very difficult. There was an afternoon, a, a friend had come over. I think we were talking about a lot of things that were wrong with the world, but the conversation shifted to religion. And he said he just didn't see any point in his church. He said, it's all just, it's empty ritual. It means nothing. And I think at that point, I, I piled on with something about how the members of my church didn't walk their talk. <laughs> yeah, feel free to laugh. <laughs> I don't know why I thought church membership ensured human perfection, but, but at that age, apparently I did. But we were both earnest enough about the, the value of church that we started to talk about, well, what would an ideal church be like? And we got so serious that I got a piece of paper and a pen and we started making a list of rules for our ideal church. Well, it was, it was going along okay until one of us said, and it should be a rule, everyone has to believe that God is all powerful. And that's when we looked at each other and realized that neither of us did. Because as my friend put it, you know, what kind of God would allow? The poverty, the disease, the, the suffering, the corruption that we see in the world around us, what kind of God would let that be? And I didn't have an answer for him at that moment. So, well, that was the end of our ideal church. <laughs> there is a passage in Science and Health that I think if I had given it serious thought at that time, it might have saved me years of trouble. It's right toward the beginning of the book, and it says, the time for thinkers has come. Truth independent of doctrines and time-honored systems knocks at the portal of humanity. Contentment with the past and the cold conventionality of materialism are crumbling away. Ignorance of God is no longer the stepping stone to faith. And I think at that point, faith was pretty much off my radar. I was certainly theologically ignorant, but I did consider myself a thinker. And it would have done me good at that point to remember that there's such a thing as divine truth, that I might have turned there for inspiration for a better understanding, instead of just you know, intellectually tinkering with those time-honored systems. But the problem was, and I didn't realize it, 
I had accepted the cold conventionality of materialism without even realizing it. I was like, you know, the, the fish who's swimming along and another fish calls out, hey, how's the water? And I would have said, what's water? So instead of thinking my way to a brave new world, I was just going with the flow of materialism without questioning it. So when I got to college, I stopped going to church. I dismissed religion as something I'd outgrown. But what I could not dismiss were those healings. If God had not been the cause of those experiences, well, I wanted to know what was because I knew they had happened. But nothing that I was hearing in my psychology classes, my philosophy classes, gave me answers that really rang true to my own experience. So as time went on and life got more complicated, I started asking more questions. The big questions, you know, what is really going on here? Who am I? What am I here for? And I started looking into different spiritual disciplines and practices in search of answers to those questions. But all that I read in sacred texts, all that I found in the meditation hall were really more questions. <laughs> So I headed into my 30s with a lot of unanswered questions and, and also an array of medical problems that didn't have a medical solution. I'd been diagnosed with endometriosis and told it was so pervasive I'd never have children. I had migraines and my back was always going out and I had chronic pain that moved around. And it was sometimes so acute as to be disabling. And I asked a doctor, I said, well, what is the source of this pain? Where is it coming from? And he said, oh, it has no source. This is phantom pain. So I looked into alternative medicine and I tried acupuncture and Chinese herbs and homeopathy and nothing was providing long-term relief. There came a year where I'd had a, a surgery that hadn't helped, and then at the end of that year, I contracted what one doctor assured me was a rare strain of malaria. So now on top of everything else, I have this fever that doesn't break. It's all day and all night. It's going into its fourth week, and I feel like my life is over because all I can do on any given day, I can sit up in bed, I, I can read a little bit. Sometimes I'd make it out to the couch in the living room. I remember sitting there one afternoon just weeping about what my life had become. So one night I was lying awake and I was thinking about some books I'd been reading on quantum physics because I was still searching. And these books had all talked about the idea that the universe is observer created. And a physicist named Max Planck had said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. And I looked at the wall across from my bed and I thought, so does that mean that it's, it's not as predictably solid as it seems? And that got me started on a kind of mental inventory of all my assumptions. Because if that assumption might not be quite right, maybe none of my assumptions were correct. And so the process was like, it was like peeling a giant onion where beliefs and opinions and things that I'd come to accept secondhand all just dropped away. If I hadn't proved it in my own experience, I was going to let it go and see if there was anything left. And I wondered, because this was going on for a while, if there would be anything left. But when all those assumptions and beliefs had fallen away, there was something left. And what it was was love. And that was something I felt I knew was true. In, in the core of my being, I knew this was true. And it wasn't, it wasn't like the other thinking I'd been doing where I had been thinking about something. This was like 
like looking out from love and seeing it poured out on everything, permeating everything, including me. And that brought this wonderful wash of relief and I fell asleep. Now when I woke up in the morning, I knew right away everything was different. For one thing, the fever was gone. And I didn't know it yet, but all those physical problems were gone. But I felt, I felt full of joy and life, and I tried to go back and remember what had happened the night before. What had I been thinking? And I remembered right before bed, I'd been reading a book about the early years of Christianity, and I hadn't thought about Christianity in years, but here were these historical accounts of men and women who had heard Jesus' message and their lives were transformed. Something big had happened to them and as a result, something big happened to the world. I remember looking at the wall across from the bed and thinking, okay, so it's matter and matter is made of atoms Atoms are mostly empty space, and the empty space is filled with consciousness. So what is this consciousness that can form and transform reality? That's really the question. And then the whole thing came together in words that I had learned in Sunday school years and years before from something called the scientific statement of being. And it says, there is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation. For God is all in all. And I have to admit my first thought after that was, oh no. But I jumped out of bed and I ran into the living room and I found my childhood copy of Science and Health where I'd stuck it on top of a bookshelf and I started reading. And there, to my amazement and chagrin, were the answers to the questions I've been asking for 15 years. What is really going on here? Well, there's a divine principle to the universe and it is love. And I just experienced that. Who am I? I'm inseparable from that love. And I just experienced that. What am I here for? I'm here to express it. And on the heels of that came a, another surprising thought, which was, I want to go to church. And I didn't really know what that was about, but three days later it was Sunday and I went to church and I sat in the back, three lines into the first hymn. There's tears rolling down my cheeks because here again is that amazing sense of love. And the hymn that morning was from a poem by Mary Baker Eddy. The first lines are, O oh, gentle presence, peace and joy and power, O oh, life divine that owns each waiting hour. Everything I heard at the service that morning just affirmed and explained and magnified that sense of love. So I walked out the doors at the end of the service and I knew what I had to do. I had to hang on to this sense of life. I had to find a way to live consistently with it and from it. And I wanted to share it because it was just way too good to keep to myself. So that experience actually isn't all that exceptional. Whenever anybody catches a glimpse of the reality of God's goodness, love's presence, they have the same response. They feel joy and gratitude. They don't want to let it go. 
and they want to share it. And you see that in those early years of Christianity. People encountered first through Jesus, then through his followers, this amazing paradigm shift that St. Paul called the mind of Christ. And Christ is divine truth. It's God's love coming to us, showing us the good that's really there to be seen, clearing away our fears, healing us. If you want to see what Christ looks like in human experience, look at the life of Christ Jesus. Right? Everything he said, everything he did expressed Christ. And so here's St. Paul urging his fellow Christians to have that mind, the mind that was in Christ Jesus, implying that we can, that we can have the understanding that lay behind Jesus' teachings, and his healing works, that, that we can do those healing works as he promised his followers they could through this understanding. And people responded. There was a young woman named Thecla who lived in a town called Iconium in Turkey. And she sat in her window listening to Paul preach when he came to that town. She sat there for three days listening to him, and then she walked out the door, leaving behind the, the life her family expected her to leave, leaving behind the, the marriage her parents were arranging for her, and she became a follower of Paul, and eventually, actually, a partner in his ministry. And she's just one of the many, many people who had this kind of response to Jesus' message of God's love. Before a stone was ever laid in a church building, there was this movement of transformation and response to the Christ. It was like a stone dropped in a pond, and that was love, and the ripples went out, and that was church. So there's only two places in the Gospels where you even find that word that we read, church. But in the original Greek, it's ekklesia. And ekklesia just meant a gathering, people who were called together. Could be anything. So the really definitive place is in Matthew, where Jesus asks his disciples to tell them, who, who do you think I am? And the disciple Simon answers, and he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus agrees. And he says, you are Peter, from the Greek word Petros, meaning rock. And he says, on this rock, I will build my ecclesia. So Jesus' church that the people his words and works had summoned together had as their foundation this understanding, this recognition of Christ. Divine truth and love coming and showing us we're inseparable from the life that is God. Now, Paul wrote a lot about ecclesia. He called church the body of Christ. that we are all indispensable, invaluable members, parts of this larger expression of God's love and truth. So not a, not a physical body by any stretch of the imagination. He wrote to the new Christians at Corinth who lived in a town that was world famous for its fancy Greek temples. And he told them, you are the temple of the living God. You don't have to go into one of those buildings to find God. You are the place where God's qualities shine through. So, so think like it, act like it. And then in one of the letters of Peter, we find this. Peter wrote, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You've experienced it. You get it. 
ye as lively stones are built up a spiritual house acceptable to God. And you find that that same spiritual sense of church in science and health. And Mary Baker Eddy describes church this way. She says, it's the structure of truth and love. Whatever rests upon and proceeds from divine principle. So it's interesting that if you look up the word structure in the dictionary of her day, which was the 1828 Webster's, the first meaning of the word is not a physical thing. It says structure, the act of building. So this church is not a human creation. It's a divine expression. It's the effect of the living God. And we become part of it whenever we think from and act from, live from the mind of Christ. So now, in retrospect, I get why my experience of love's presence as, a, as an actual law of being prompted a desire for church. The recognition of love includes this call, this, this summons of the Christian ecclesia to, to not let go of this spiritual sense of life that you've discovered and, and to share it. So how we are able to do that is at the heart of the discovery of Christian science. When Mary Baker Eddy made her discovery in 1866 that there are actually laws of truth and love that support our ability to think from the mind of Christ, to have that mind with all of its healing and transformation. She thought this was going to be welcomed with open arms by the public and the Christian churches. And the movement did grow exponentially as, as people were being healed by that discovery. But in 1866, the powers that were, the men of science, the doctors of divinity, were almost entirely male. And they had a hard time with the idea that a woman from rural New England could be a legitimate theologian could have something important to contribute to the conversation about science and medicine. And so her ideas were often harshly attacked. She herself was, was attacked by these men who brought a great deal of arrogance and misogyny <laughs> to the situation. And thus this was something she had to contend with. But I want to share with you a a very different perspective on her from one of her contemporaries. And this is a quote from Clara Barton. And Clara Barton is the woman who founded the Red Cross and of course was herself no stranger to misogyny. But she was questioned by a reporter about Mary Baker Eddy and she said, Mrs. Eddy should have the respect admiration and love of the whole nation, for she is its greatest woman. Love permeates all the teachings of this great woman. So great, I believe, that at this perspective we can scarcely realize how great. And I think the greatness that, that Clara Barton was talking about wasn't, wasn't just that, that Mary Baker Eddy had built a church in Boston, that she'd founded a Christian denomination, that she published books and periodicals on Christian healing, started a newspaper, the Christian Science Monitor, to improve the standard of journalism. I think what Clara Barton is talking about, well, first, it's, it's the transformational effect that Christian Science was having all around her, the thousands of people who were being healed by it, whose lives were improved by it. 
but I think that she's also talking about Mary Baker Eddy's character and her, her tenacious devotion to sharing this message of God as a present help. And when I read biographies of Mary Baker Eddy, when I go online to the Mary Baker Eddy Library, which is something you can all do and read about her life, what I see there is how uniquely fitted she was to make the discovery and to share the message. So she grew up in a New Hampshire farming community. Her family were, in her words, of Puritan stock. And you know, put aside whatever cliches you may attach to that term Puritan, and consider that these were people who, who earnestly believed that fulfilling one's duty to God was the entire purpose of existence. So that's the atmosphere she grew up in. And she had great love of God as a child, great faith. And this was shown in her ability to help others through prayer. So when one of the farm animals would be sick, the family would bring it to Mary and it would get well. When her older brother George accidentally gashed his leg open with an ax, her father brought Mary to him and the wound healed so quickly that it startled their family doctor. Now through her childhood and then later in adulthood, she struggled with chronic illness and she spent decades trying to find a dependable way to well-being, not just for herself, but, but for the people that she wanted to help. And she wrote about this in her, her memoir called Retrospection and Introspection. She said, during 20 years prior to my discovery, I had been trying to trace all physical effects to a mental cause. And in the latter part of 1866, I gained the scientific certainty that all causation was mind. That's a capital M signifying God. And every effect, a mental phenomenon. So she had studied allopathic medicine with a, a licensed physician, Western medicine. She had become a licensed homeopathic physician. She had experimented with a variety of different health cures and systems and and what her studies and experiences showed her was that that our experience is definitely connected to if not entirely governed by thought i mean today a doctor will tell a patient to be hopeful and optimistic because they know that thought matters but Given the many times she had turned to God and, and found proofs of God's healing power, she intuitively understood that the good that she was in search of was inseparable from God. And so all through these years, she kept up a dedicated study of her Bible, knowing that a, a deeper understanding of God's nature was going to relate directly to what she was looking for. And for me, it, those two qualities, it's, it's, her, it's her persistence, the way she did not let any kind of adversity stop her search for truth that would help and heal herself and others, and also her steadfast faith. Because as somebody who I mean, I caught a pretty good glimpse of God's goodness as a child. And then I just totally lost sight of spirit. And so I've since come to value not leaving God out of your calculations, which is something she never did. So this brings us to 1866. She's in a seemingly hopeless condition. Her friends, her pastor, her doctor are expecting her to pass on at any moment. And she turns to her Bible and opens to one of the accounts of Jesus' healings. And she sees there the timelessness of Christ. 
that the truth and love that Jesus said were God had to be as present and powerful and authoritative in that moment for her as they had been nearly 19 centuries before. And with this realization, she becomes suddenly well. And then she meets with resistance. And I think this is every bit as an important part of the discovery as the initial revelation. If you're trying to practice living from the discovery, this is really critical. So in her case, the resistance appears in the form of her doctor who comes to call on her. She greets them at the door. She's dressed apparently well, rejoicing in her health. And his immediate reaction is to tell her she cannot possibly be well. That the severity, the extent of the internal injuries that she's suffered in a recent fall a few days before make recovery like this impossible. And he had diagnosed her at the time as having a concussion, and so perhaps he thinks she's not quite in her right mind, and so he questions her. And he explains to her very carefully that there's no way she could have gotten better this quickly. And as he's doing this, she starts to feel weak and faint on the point of collapse. And seeing this, he settles her in a chair. And then because there isn't anything else he can do for her medically, he wishes her well, and he leaves. And she goes back to her Bible. And she opens again to another account of Jesus' healing. And there she finds what she later called the living, palpitating presence of Christ. And the relapse ends. So it's these, it's these two components of the discovery, the, the revelation that there are divine laws of truth and love that sustain and support us. And the fact that the human mind has got to yield. It's got to give up its its expectations, its condemnations, and yield to the mind of Christ. And you actually see those same two factors at work in the early years of Christianity. Because, of course, the early Christians faced appalling obstacles. They, they faced persecution and imprisonment and execution. And their response to, to these existential threats was prayer. So this was not a prayer begging God to make for them a path of flowers. This was a prayer that acknowledged what Jesus had taught them about the power of love, that there was no place they could ever be, no room they would ever be in where this love was not the biggest thing, in fact, really the only thing. And so when when Paul was stoned for preaching Christ, dragged out of the city gates and left for dead. His fellow Christians came and gathered around him and prayed. And Paul got up and he went back to preaching. If you look at the book in the Bible where the accounts of this period and time are all written down, it is not called, as we might be tempted to call it, the book of the terrible times and the horrible things we suffered. It's called The Acts of the Apostles. And it is a book full of grace and healing and revelation. When Mary Baker Eddy wrote about her own experiences with adversity, she called them God's gracious preparation. She didn't mean that, that God intends or sends adversity, but that when we, like those early Christians, turn with hope and faith in the reality of God's goodness, we're going to find that it's there. It's going to change our experience. We're going to find that adversity is not a proof of God's absence. Adversity is a chance for us to prove love's presence. And, and we won't do this by you know, 
putting on a brave face or, or through willpower or the power of positive thinking. The, the, the human mind is not a factor in this. But we will make our own proofs of love's care when our God-given desire for and love of good welcomes the Christ. That is the methodology, the how-to of Christian science. So I have a friend who liked to say that those words Christian and science are like a match and a stick of dynamite. So you keep them apart, nothing happens. But you put them together. You put together what Jesus knew about the nature of God with the fact that it is it is based in divine law that's good for all time, and something big happens. And I'm not talking about a, a destructive explosion. I'm talking about a, a powerful disruption of fear and sorrow and anger and that merely material, coldly conventional sense of things gets blown away. There is a, a burst of light and we see ourselves and everything in the light of spirit, whole and intact and blessed and blessing. And that is the paradigm shift that brings that transformation and healing that we all need so much. So the question naturally is, how do, we, how do we make that change? How do we change our basis? Now, when Mary Baker Eddy first started sharing her discovery teaching students, she realized right away that this was not going to be an intellectual download. This is not an academic topic that the hearts and minds of those students had to be prepared to receive the message and then to live consistently with it and from it. So as, as her ecclesia grew, she developed bylaws and a form of church government designed to turn its members to God for everything, whether it had to do with the challenges of their day-to-day -day life or the running of an organizational church, the mind of Christ was to take precedence over everything. So this brings me back to what she said about church. She said, the church is that institution which affords proof of its utility, is found elevating the race, rousing the dormant understanding from material beliefs to the apprehension of spiritual ideas and the demonstration of divine science, thereby casting out devils or error and healing the sick. So again, it, it really helps to know that in, in her dictionary, that 1828 Webster's, the first meaning of the word institution is one of those almost verbs. It's institution, the act of establishing. So she saw that church understood and participated in as God's expression. It would prove the practicality of Jesus' teachings. It would show that it is natural for us to think and live from this basis. And it would, in her words, reinstate primitive Christianity and its lost element of healing. So this church is, it's an act of building. It's, it's a place where there's an ongoing up-leveling of our understanding that comes through inspiration and revelation and sharing this truth with each other. 
So you go into a, a Christian science church on a Wednesday evening and you'll hear people talking about their experience with this, with living from this different basis. What happens when you do? And you'll hear about healing because healing is really a side effect of the mind of Christ. In my branch church in the last year, I heard healings of COVID, of paralysis, member who recovered right away after her foot had been run over by a car, I heard a healing of a, a colicky horse, the recovery of a lost dog. I mean, all, of, all of the things that were shared in my branch just pointed to the naturalness of living this way. And so often I sit there on a Wednesday and I think, you know what, this is what's normal for us. So I said at the beginning of our time together that my experience had given me hope. Hope that we could, in Albert Einstein's words, not only survive, but move toward those higher levels. Now Einstein made that quote in 1946. So this was right after two atomic bombs had been dropped in Japan. But I think that what he said is as relevant for us now as it was then. Because if you looked at the news in 1946, well, you'd see pretty much the same things that had so disturbed me in 1976 that is still going on today. I glanced at the news this morning. I saw there was a shooting in Paso Robles in a park. I saw there are National Guard in the subways of New York that the Russians are contemplating the nuclear option. And it's very much the same news. There's something called the, the Pew Global State of Emotions poll that shows that every year people are getting more anxious and depressed and angry. And we live in a 24-7 news cycle in which we're bombarded continually with lots of reasons to be sad and mad and scared. I saw, I don't know if you've seen, there's a bumper sticker out there. It says, if you're not outraged, you're just not paying attention. And we know we're supposed to pay attention. But I think we have to consider what we are laser focusing our attention on because what my experience showed me, what, what Mary Baker Eddy's writings show me, what the teachings of Christ Jesus tell me is that this grim, hopeless picture of the world is not the whole picture. In fact, because it so completely leaves God out, it's not the true picture at all. There is a dependable way to find love's presence and that practical goodness. And I think on some level, we all know this. It's what we want for ourselves. It's what we want for everyone. There's been a lot written in the past few years about the decline of church. You know, people just aren't going anymore. But what has struck me most about these articles is the comment section. So people are replying and they're saying, well, I don't go to church, but I still pray. I think of myself as spiritual, even though I'm not religious. And people were writing in saying what they missed about church. They missed the fellowship. They missed the inspiration. And they were trying in different ways to, to recreate that in, in different venues. But as, as one of the writers said, you know, if you're going through something really trying and traumatic in your life, as nice as the people in your soul cycle group or your knitting circle are, they're probably not equipped to give you the kind of spiritual comfort and counsel that you need so much. There was an op-ed by a writer who said that well, churches are trying to bring people back by, by updating their liturgy and modernizing their music and holding their services in a coffee shop. 
but that these strategies weren't working because in his words, there's a, a human yearning for an experience of living spirit. And you can't strategize your way to that. But if you take away nothing else today, take away this, that that experience is available and it is natural for you. So I just want to close with three really short illustrations of what that looks like. First, what it looks like in church, when church is lived as God's expression. So when I came back to church, I joined and became a member. And shortly after, our church decided they wanted to rewrite the bylaws because they hadn't been looked at in decades. And so we had a business meeting at which we discovered that there were as many opinions about what the new bylaw should be as there were people in the room. And I have to say that night was not our finest hour because personalities clashed and harsh words were spoken and people did not leave happy. But as unhappy as we all were at the end of that evening, I knew we were going to go home and pray. And that ultimately, ultimately our prayer was not going to be, please God, make them agree with me. It was going to be a prayer of listening. And so there were three months before the next meeting and I couldn't see any kind of consensus happening during that time. But I knew we were praying. I knew I was praying to know that, that our church was a divine expression. It wasn't just a group of personalities who came together for better or worse, but that we were the place where, where God is seen and heard and felt, as Paul said. So the night for the meeting came and we all came together and votes were taken on different bylaws and every vote was unanimous. It was, it was stunning actually, the unanimity in that room. And afterwards when we were talking together, people, they talked about the palpable sense of love that they had felt and they talked about how they had come determined to listen and they had, and they voted with what they heard. And what did it reveal? There we were all in one accord, in one place, as it says in the book of Acts. So I share that because it's not only good for church, but any situation where it seems like you're, you're dealing with divisions, personalities that will never come together. It is possible by allowing that, that there is a divine mind that is infinitely bigger than all, all of these little personalities, that we are all subject to that mind and that it shines through where we are. We can have a different experience of community. So the second illustration has to do with what happens when we do come together all in one accord in one place, what a difference that can make. A couple of years ago in New Mexico, we had really bad wildfires. Usually I can look out my window and I can see most of the way to Albuquerque from Santa Fe. On this week I opened my curtains, I couldn't see 50 feet, the smoke was so thick. And that week our, our church at the Wednesday readings, um, our first reader had selections from the Bible and science and health that were all about God's care in dangerous situations. And then people got up and talked about their experiences with that care in times of danger. And despite the fact that those fires had been going on for a few days and still seemed to be raging, there was a real sense of peace in that room at the end of the service, a sense of optimism about our being cared for. So over the course of the next few days, the fires were put out. And then the next Wednesday, a man who had been visiting the week before came back to church to share what had happened to him from what he had heard. He had a cabin that had been in his family for over a century, and it was right in the heart of where two of these fires were burning. And he said he'd been listening to the radio for the hourly updates on the destruction. But that after that Wednesday, he thought, no, I'm going to turn off the radio. I'm going to think about what God is doing. 
right where all that destruction seems to be happening. And he talked about the peace that had come to him through doing that. And then a friend had gotten up to where his cabin was in a four-wheel and called him up. And he said, man, it's a miracle. Your cabin is, is untouched. And you could see where the fire had come down one hillside. It had jumped a creek and then just turned and went away. And then the same thing had happened on the other side. And the man said he knew it wasn't a miracle, that it was just evidence of the truth that he'd been seeing about God's care. So I share that because no matter how bad the news gets, no matter how it seems like we're surrounded by obstacles and a lack of good, it is possible to see the reality of God's care and experience the tangible effect of that. So the last example has to do with, with being a, a living stone. What is that like? So when I went to church in, in Wisconsin, there was a member of our church there who would come in Wednesday evenings just all fired up with what she'd been learning from reading the weekly Bible lesson. So Christian scientists go to church on Sunday, we hear a Bible lesson sermon. But most church members tend to start studying that sermon a week before because we have access to it. So Barb would read the lesson on Monday and she said she'd take the ideas out for a test drive on Tuesday. <laughs> and then on Wednesday, she'd come back to church and she'd share with us how that was going. And it was always really inspiring when you saw Barb stand up because you knew you were going to hear some wonderful things. So one Wednesday, she told us that she had been taking out her trash that morning and her neighbor came over, asked if she would pray. Would you pray for my husband? He's in the hospital. He has stage four cancer. And the doctors say he's not going to live out the week. And Barb said, yes, of course, I'll pray. And she went home and she thought a little bit about, well, what's the best way for me to do this? And then she thought, I'm going to read the lesson again. So she, she took it. She said she went through it three times before she realized that everything in it was, it was true for her. It was true for her neighbor. It was true for her neighbor's husband. Everybody in that hospital, this was the truth. These ideas about God's presence and power and goodness. And that's where she left it that Wednesday. The next week she was back and she said, I was taking out my trash this morning. There was my neighbor's husband taking out their trash. And she'd gone over and and told him how glad she was to see him. And he said, well, I've never been so happy to take out the trash in my life. <laughs> but that the Thursday before, the day after she'd started praying, the doctors had decided they wanted to do more tests. And they put him through these tests and the cancer was gone. So some very happy doctors sent this very happy man and his wife home. So I share that because the, the truth that you see sitting in your living room, taking a walk, driving on the freeway. That truth is like that stone dropped in a pond and the ripples go out. It makes a difference. So as you change your basis, truly you change the world and you live as the place where God is seen and felt. I want to thank you all again for, for being here this afternoon. And I'll, I'll stick around if anybody has any questions.